things to remember about this, right? Your patient at this point would be coming out of um, the peripheral vascular or just finished peripheral vascular. So they'll actually be in a supine position. Um, but today, first thing first, hi, everybody. Hold on, PC of North Southeastern. I'll be doing your abdominal today. Sounds good. So if you want to let me take off your shirt. Um, and of course, socks and shoes will be on. I'll let you keep your socks on there. So in the meantime, I'm going to go wash my hands. So how's it going today? Feeling pretty good? Pretty good. So what am I doing right now? Just by carrying on the conversation with my patient? Yeah, it's just my general survey. I'm looking for signs of distress and that he's uncomfortable, uh, right? And he looks pretty good, no apparent distress. Right? Okay. So I have some kind of horrible thing. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and have a lay back for a few of my Just go to lay back. I'm going to grab my table. Put it in that position. Okay, very good. Now, the important thing, if you look, number 35, right out of the beginning, it says that the patient must lie on a flat. Right, remember in pulmonary and cardiovascular, they're at a 45 degree angle, 30 to 45. This one, we need to keep him in a supine position. We're going to have him flex his knees, or bend at the knees, and then his arms will lie right to his side. Exposure for our patient. If you're in a hospital setting or a clinic setting, more than likely, uh, your MA or RN, whoever's working with you, will already have your patient in a gown and draped with a sheet. So we need to move the gown up. I usually take the sheet and the gown and I kind of move the gown up just to the xiphoid, so that I'm at the xiphoid process needs to be exposed, and I move the sheet down just over the suprapubic region so that I have the full abdomen uh, exposed. Okay? So that is the right position. Arms at the side, knees flexed, draped from the xiphoid to the suprapubic region. All right, so I'm going to instruct my patient that I'd like for you to lay in the supine position with your knees bent uh, throughout the entire exam, and I'm going to take a look at your abdomen. Okay. So what's the first thing we do on any system? Inspect. It's always inspection first. So we're inspecting for contour and the symmetry, the skin lesions like scars, striae, or rashes, um, and then we're also looking for pulsations. This in the lab, you don't have to do it here, but in the exam room. I mean, uh, excuse me, the lecture, it actually shows tangential writing or talks about it. Just like when we're looking for lifts and heaves on the chest wall, we can also use tangential writing to look for pulsation in the abdomen. We talk about whether the abdomen is protuberant, rounded. Um, we, can, we talk about also that is the abdomen um, um, flat or concave, right? We talk about the shapes of the abdomen, right? So once we've inspected the abdomen, we say that the abdomen is flat and non-distended. Right? No scars, no striae. Number 38 is auscultation. So when we auscultate the abdomen, it's with the, uh, the diaphragm, I'm sorry, the diaphragm first. So we're gonna listen to, with the diaphragm. If the patient has a complaint in a certain area of the abdomen, that would be the last place that we actually do our exam. So for this gentleman, he has no complaints. So we're gonna start in the right upper quadrant I'm listening with the diaphragm over the right upper quadrant. I'm listening with the left upper quadrant. The left lower quadrant. The right lower quadrant. I'd also talked in class about the four plus three abdominal exam. So we have the four quadrants. It's divided superior and inferiorly by the umbilicus, and then the left and right side by the umbilicus. The regions, right, are the three regions. We have the epigastric region, which lies just inferior to the xiphoid process. We have the periumbilical or the umbilical region, right, around the umbilicus. Then we have the hypogastric or the suprapubic region, which is just above the suprapubic line. Okay, so on our exam, we're going to do the four quadrants, and the three regions. Right? So in auscultation, we listen for bowel sounds which are present. Okay, that's our key indicator of performance. Um, and then we're going to listen to the abdominal vessels, right? So this, we have to use the bell of the stethoscope, right? We listen for breweries. We talked about the areas that we listen for breweries. The first place is going to be the aortic. The aortic lies just to the left of midline, but just to the left. Then there's the renal, the left renal, right renal. 
just inferior to umbilicus, iliac, left iliac. Then we would mention, we would listen to the femoral pulses, palpate for inguinal lymph nodes, right? So at this point, you say the femoral pulse is full and equal bilaterally, and there's no inguinal adeno, uh, lymphadenopathy, uh, no bruises are noted, right? Percussion. Now we're going to percuss the general abdominal um, regions for tympani in all four quadrants, um, and there can be some dullness, right? Same regions, so right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, tympani. A little on the dull side, tympani, epigastrum, umbilical, suprapubic, changes. Would you agree? got a liver over here, solid, and I expect dull, but I have a spleen on this side, I expect this also to be dull. Probably more tympanic, because the spleen lies so, so, so far back. So this is probably still tympanic. Gastric air bubble should be here, so tympany. Down here I've just got, um, I've got the descending colon down here. I've also got the colon on this side. I've also got some small bowel around the umbilicus. Why do you think I'm having dullness down here? I hear bowel movement, BM, feces, stool. The other class called it breakfast <laughs> because it's got to, to, to actually ascend, transverse, and descend. That's probably breakfast on this side, right? This is probably lunch. We know about digestion, right? Out of the stomach in how four to six hours? Four to six hours is out of the stomach into the small bowel. Eight hours is into the large bowel, eight to 10 hours, and then 14 to 16 hours it's out. So we expect to find some dullness in those uh, distal portions, okay? So um, we've got uh, percussion for tympani and dullness, right, which was done. Now, liver percussion. We're going to percuss the liver in the midclavicular line. I told you that um, for me, I like to start because I've found a lot of pathology this way in the liver. I like to start around the umbilical region. That's my first sign of doll. That totally changed. Tympani, doll. That's not resonant, so that's definitely not long, right? I'm in the midclavicular line, doll. Tympani, dullness. Resonance, right on. So coming from tympani to dullness, that is my bottom liver edge, my border. That's where I make a mental note where I find that, right? So it's like in the fifth intercostal space midclavicular line on the right side, right? So now from here, because he's male, I don't have to percuss through a bunch of breast tissue. I'm gonna start up high. Bates says start high and go from resonance to dullness. That's about my fourth intercostal space, so he does not have a very large liver uh, measurement, right? So with my measuring tape, he is five centimeters, all right, in the midclavicular line, okay? Spleen percussion. This happens in the sixth intercostal space. We know that the heart border, the right atrium, the right ventricle, uh, the apex of the heart lie in the fifth intercostal space, left sternal border, and it kind of descends all the way up, just about to the midclavicular line, and then you're applying the apex of the heart, right? That's fifth intercostal space. We're gonna drop to the sixth intercostal space, which is the space just below it. We're gonna start in the midclavicular line, Looking for a tympani, 
we go from the anterior axillary line to the mid axillary line, which is termed Trabeau space. Once we get to the mid axillary, and have you take a deep breath. And that's my percussion sign. If it goes from timpani to dull, that's a positive sign for a potential enlarged spleen. Okay? His doesn't. So one more time, six to the intercostal space. Take a deep breath in. No change. Okay? So um, that spleen percussion sign is when we percuss over that place when he takes a deep breath in. So no spleen and megaly is noted at the timpani. Um, now we're going to do our light palpation. Light palpation will follow the same order that we did auscultation. Light palpation can be done with two hands, and it's more of a using the pads, and I'm displacing tissue, right? So that's my right upper quadrant, my left upper quadrant, my left lower quadrant. You know that tender? Yep. When I'm palpating, I'm looking at his faces as well to see if his face changes, like winces or grimaces, right? So no tenderness. Then my epigastric, periumbilical, my suprapubic region, light palpation, no tenderness. I'm gonna go a little deeper. Nothing. Right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, my left lower quadrant, my right lower quadrant, epigastric, periumbilical, suprapubic or hypogastric region. Okay? So no tenderness elicited. Okay? My deep uh, my rebound tenderness is whenever I'm palpating my patient's belly and I get to it, he says that this is where it hurts the most, sir. Like, okay, that's the last place I'm gonna go. That's the last place I want to palpate. When I get over that region, right? We've already deep palpated everything. He's like, oh yeah, man, that really hurts, that really hurts, that really hurts. And I'm like, tell me which hurts worse when I push in or when I let go. When he tells me, oh my gosh, that hurt horribly, whenever I let go, this would be rebound tenderness. Right on? So deep palpation, deep palpation, deep. Oh yeah, man, that really hurts right there. Tell me which one hurts more, that or that. That's rebound, okay? So for him though, there's no rebound tenderness. Abdominal aorta, um, it's typically less than three centimeters. Um, and it should have no lateral expansion. Uh, of course, it has lateral pul pulsations, but no lateral expansion, meaning it should not be greater than three centimeters. So when I measure his abdominal aorta, I come up to his abdomen. Remember that, a couple of things here. If we go too high into the abdomen, because of the regular diameter of the chest, you got further to go because where does the aorta lie? It's retroperitoneal, right? Right behind the peritoneum. So we've got to get pretty deep on it. So I know it just lies left to the mid, um, the midline, just a little bit to the left. So I'm going to put a little pressure here. Let me know if this hurts. And then I'm going to take this finger and I'm going to bring it in here. I'm going to try the lateral, try to find the lateral pulsation to my right hand. So this finger, I found the edge. I found the right side of the aortic wall. As I move my finger out, I'm gonna find the lateral portion where it's just abutting my finger, my right finger, my right index. Once I find that, once I find that, that's when I'm gonna make that measurement. Right, that's when I'm gonna take the measurement from here to here. And he is approximately, Two and a half centimeters. Just remember the things you got to remember here is that you need to come down into the abdomen almost lateral to the umbilicus is the easiest place. You go too high you got a lot of more tissue to go through. Right? Remember it's retroperitoneal so this light finger stuff is not going to work. You got to really get deep and find it. Okay? So for us we say that the abdominal aorta is 2.5 centimeters wide without lateral expansion of pulsation. Congratulations. Liver borders, right? We're looking for a costal margin, right, in the midclavicular line. Um, the, you, the best way I found is I kind of use the inside, um, the lateral aspect of the index finger and the palm because I can cover so much space, right? And it kind of fits nicely right up into 
um, that costal um, that costal margin. So I'm going to have my patient take a deep breath in. That brings what the liver down into my hand, and then let it out. Then I kind of slide my hand up into that costal margin. I'm trying to feel for a liver edge. I don't feel anything. You need that tender? No. So that is my liver border. So liver is not palpable and non-tender. Okay. Now I'm going to have you lay on your right side, roll the knee. I'm going to palpate for the, the spleen. That's what I'm looking for. So you can bring this arm forward, just like so. So, this hand supports his back. I'm going to bring him into my hand. If you notice, I've got the costal angle again here. Once again, I'm going to apply pressure. Okay, breathe in. That should bring the spleen into my hand. I don't feel it, and then let it out. Exhale. And I push against it. Any tenderness? No. No. So no palpable spleen. The spleen is non-palpable. Okay, so I'm coming back. Abdominal reflexes, T8 and 9, and some of 10 manage the upper reflexes. Um, 11 and 12 are typically the lower, but also has a branch of, the, of 10 as well. This is a matter of the umbilicus actually moving, if it will. So when I actually strike, when I actually cause this uh, sensory, the umbilicus should move to one side or the other. It doesn't here. So he doesn't have a reflex. So with that said, that's not an abnormal finding either. Abdominal reflexes would mean something to me if he has horrible abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, a fever, I suspect a perforated bowel or a perforated appendix or um, some kind of peritonitis, then I will definitely not have a reflex in the in the abdominal reflex, right? But not having one doesn't mean much to me either, especially when it's not associated with anything else. It doesn't mean anything, okay? So for us, we're gonna say that um, abdominal reflex is not present. Remember that we always mention the genital urinary exam. Anytime that we have pain that lies around the umbilicus or, or inferior to the umbilicus, that has pretty much requires uh, pretty much requires a genital urinary exam, right? We can have all kinds of um, hernias. You can have ephemeral or uh, indirect hernias, inguinal hernias, right? So that should be evaluated. In females, you can have PAD or some other infectious process in the pelvis, um, and the pain just kind of migrates up into the abdomen. So you've got to be able to differentiate it. So any pain that migrates above the umbilicus will require genital urinary, and of course, a rectal exam, looking for hematochesia or melanoma masses, tendinous, and the rectum. All right, so make sure we mention that. That's number 50. Special tests. So on exam day, there will be special tests we'll ask you folks to do. There'll be one of these six. Uh, Murphy sign is first. That's what I'm gonna demonstrate first. Murphy sign is just where we take our hand applied into that right upper quadrant again. Take a deep breath in. While he inspires, at any point he splints, meaning that he stops inspiration because it hurts so bad, that is a positive Murphy sign. Or exhale, ah, and it stopped him again. That is a sign of a positive Murphy sign. So, in, for, so cessation of inspiration on that palpation of the right upper quadrant would be a positive Murphy sign. The iliop psoas sign, both legs for these exams, they're both extended. I'm gonna have you raise this leg up and I kind of help him put him into that position. I want you to hold it right there. Don't let me push it down. Iliopsoas, so I'll push on it. Does that cause pain in your abdomen? Positive would be a sign of peritonitis, typically associated with appendicitis. So all I'm doing is I'm causing that iliopsoas to bump up against, as it flexes, bump up against that inflamed appendix, iliopsoas. Dob trader internus, I flex him at his hip, I flex him at his hip, I flex him at the knee, and then I internally rotate, right, internal rotation, where is the obturatus internus? And that would also do the same concept as the iliopsoas causing that muscle to flex against the appendix or an inflamed tissue around the appendix, right? That right there would hurt in his abdomen, okay? Um, then there's the old heel tap. Heel tap, I just grab my other ankle and I lift him up, the knee stays locked just like that. And I just give him a couple of hits, just like that. See how it moves his abdomen? That reverberation of those muscles, it would cause pain in the peritoneum, okay? So that's a heel tap. Uh, and then the shifting dullness. Shifting dullness is as simple as this. If we're on the side and we have this patient with a protuberant belly, 
He's drawn this for sure. His abdomen is kind of rigid to touch, right? He's very distant. When I go to this side, I'll reach around him, and I start percussing the flank. As I percuss the flank, I note that the note is dull. It's a dull sound. And I start percussing up the abdominal wall. Dull, 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 until I get to a resonant sound. And the reason it's resonant is because I've trapped air. That is true air trapped in the abdomen, so this becomes very resonant. Right, resonant, resonant. So I mark that line. Dullness started here, resonance started here, okay? Now I'm gonna roll you up on your right side. So as I moved him up, what do you think happened between this dullness and this resonant? No, they swap, right? So it now becomes more resonant up top. So where it was dull, I marked it as dull or I have a mental mark in my brain, it was dull there. It is now resonant. The air has moved up and the dullness has now shifted to where it was once resonant, right? Shifting dullness. So they change places. Air comes to the top, fluid travels to the bottom, right? That's shifting dullness, that way back. And the last but not least is the good old Rob Singh sign. Rob Singh sign, as I'm moving across, if my patient tells me he has pain in his right lower quadrant or left lower, it doesn't matter, but in the right lower quadrant specifically, as I'm moving across and I'm doing my deep palpation, right, I'm in my left lower quadrant, pain's in the right lower quadrant, I think it's appendicitis. As I apply pressure in there, does that hurt? He's like, no, no, really, man, that's not the spot, it's on the other side. The minute that I do this number, he would actually feel pain in the right lower quadrant. That would be a positive Rob scene, right? So deep palpation in the left, deep, release fast, trying to elicit rebound. I get the rebound, but it's on the opposite side in the right lower quadrant. That's a positive Rob scene.